I do want to say, <laughs> I do want to say that the reason I ask um, for the land acknowledgement piece is simply because I think it's very important that we acknowledge who was here before us. Space and place is really important to the work that I do and acknowledging that we, that there have been um, people on the land that we are on, not only honors them, but reminds us that they are not in the past, that they are still here. Um, so if you get a chance to do that, uh, there is a, um, uh, uh, a land map, Keith, if you can just post that in the, um, uh, in the chat, that would be wonderful. And I'm going to go ahead and get it started here. And never hit the share button. Okay, so you're going to have a studio visit. Um, and what this is, is a, an intimate exchange. Let's be honest. A studio visit is oh, such a personal endeavor. Um, for all of us, you know, and I think um, every single studio visit I go into, I have a little bit of nerves, a little bit of butterflies because I'm getting an opportunity to share space with someone that I find um, interesting and exciting. Um, so this is an opportunity for curators, for critics, for gallerists, for collectors, other artists, etc., to get uh, a chance to experience art in its native context, right? So this face-to-face -face meetup that happens with artists has its own uh, particular rituals and routines, and in some, in some cases, expectations. Um, so it's really about building up that rapport and understanding with that hope of just sort of, let's just remove that starchy feeling of a business meeting. That's, that's generally not what this is, especially if it's a first studio visit. This is about building a relationship. I have this saying that I always say, which is, Build a relationship a mile deep and an inch wide, not a mile wide and an inch deep. Because you wanna go deeper, you wanna really truly have that connection, that contact and make that standard. Um, just, it allows both the artist and the visitor to feel relaxed enough to share, to talk about what actually is very private quite often and sometimes often experimental, right? So remember, uh, when you're doing a studio visit, you as the artist, you're the represent representative of your work, right? So be yourself. I know that that feels like disingenuous to say, I think, but also at the same time, it's really important because so often we put on a little bit of a facade because, you know, we want to protect ourselves because again, it's an intimate exchange, right? But we don't want that. We don't want, we want you to be yourself. Um, maybe if yourself is extremely arrogant, I might say, please <laughs> dampen that down. But, you know, we want you to make an impact being yourself because that, that impact can go a long way in the possibility of a purchase, uh, a, of gallery representation, or even an invitation into um, an exhibition, right? So just be yourself. Uh, if you're asked a question about your work and you don't know what the answer is, yeah, it's fine. Don't fake it. Just simply state that you don't know and go ahead and do that research on your own and let that curator, that visitor know later on what your answer is. Um, I will say though, there is one other thing that is really important about this. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love coffee. I could drink three, four five cups a day, but it gives me the jitters. So too much caffeine can make for a jittery hot mess of a studio visit. So I really wanna point out that, you know, think through um, your position. What time are you meeting? When are you at? Um, um, where are you at? Have you had coffee? Have you had too much coffee? These are really simple, silly, but true nuances that can happen in a space that can either make or break um, a studio visit. So we're hosting, you're in here, you're hosting, right? And while you're hosting it, there are a, there are a number of things that um, come to uh, uh, that come to mind when hosting. Do I clean up my space? Um, I know I've been in a number of spaces, and I want to point out that I'm not presenting this uh, um, this webinar as I know everything. I am the end all be all of all studio visits. However, I did petition a number of curators to offer their opinions in order to provide more nuance for this conversation. And so one of the things that I got from quite a number of the, of the curators was to have refreshments. 
you know, water or something to eat. I also think that if that's something that you have the capacity to do, then please go ahead and do that. But it is not required. Um, and I say that because not everyone also has the financial wherewithal to make that happen. And I would never, ever want somebody to feel that they are in a position to have to share something that they don't have the money to, to pay for. So be thoughtful. If it's really early in the morning and it's like breakfast time and you have the opportunity to share something, great, go ahead and do that. If you don't, don't think that that's going to make or break your space. Cleanliness, we're going to go back to that. Um, a lot of artists will clean up for you. And it's nice to have a clean space to sit. Don't get me wrong. You know, messes happen. We want messes to happen. That means you're in your creative zone, right? But what we want is to make sure that you are in your space. I'm the visitor, right? Give me potentially a spot to sit in um, that I'm not going to potentially get dirty because I might be moving into another meeting after that. But you do not have to clean up your entire studio and put everything away just for that for that visit because you might go right back into the work and having cleaned all that up is going to halt the work that you were doing. Personally, I prefer walking in and seeing how the artist um, does their practice. Uh, that is up to everybody though. That is a different individual case by case basis per visitor. You're gonna have some that are a little bit more staunchy that are going to really want a separate clean space for you to sit in. But also depending upon the space that you have, that maybe isn't possible. Now, when we're talking about hosting, we have to talk a little bit about the types of studio visits, right? It's, there's so many, and I may not even hit all of them today. So just bear with me, right? No two studio visits are alike. I could come in and do a studio visit. Another curator could come in right after me and it could be vastly different because it might be what it is that we are there to do. Now, I've done a number of studio visits with those of you that are on this call. And I wanna make, I wanna make it clear that this conversation may not reflect our studio visit. It might for some and it might for other, it might not for others because each one was different for different reasons. So let's talk about some of the, some of the types. You might be introducing a new body of work. That is a very, very common studio visit that happens. You know, in this case, what you want to do is you want to have work that's you have that's ready to show. Um, and you want to think about how it's lit so that the visitor can really see the work that you're doing. Again, if this is not something that you have access to do, do not worry about it. Every single one of these things are a suggestion, okay? A suggestion. Um, when, you're, when you're showcasing new work though, you do wanna clear out some of the older work that you have. You wanna create a space that's decluttered of past work because it actually might confuse the visitor. Um, however, you might wanna have a portfolio or some pieces set aside to show of your old work in case there is a historical context that's requested in order to offer context to the current body of your work. That's, that's always really important. So keep a little bit around, right? Another type of studio visit is where you're just, this is your first studio visit and you're introducing your work to someone new, right? For a lot of you, this was your first studio visit with me and you were introducing your work to someone new. This does not require you to only show your new work. Um, you can show older work, um, stuff that you've, you're, you're um, currently working on, stuff that you're thinking about, sketches from the past. Um, you can show it through the inventory, the, the physical inventory, inventory you have in your studio. You can show it through a portfolio that you may have. Maybe it's um, uh, links that you sent on a computer so that we can take a look through that. There are so many ways to show that. Um, so don't, again, worry about all of these things. Just think about what it is that you're wanting to get out of that studio visit. Another type of studio visits is open studio visits. Um, I don't, not every, artist has a studio. So this is not always possible. And I want to be really cognizant of stating that out loud that having a studio is a privilege and not every artist has that privilege. Some are working out of your kitchen. Some are working out of your living room. Some are working out of your bedroom. Um, some have a studio that's incredibly large. Some have a studio that's smaller that does not determine the value of your art. All that it does is maybe you won't end up having a, an open studio visit if you want, if you do not want to invite a bunch of people into your home. An open studio visit, however, though, is a really great way to show off your work, to make connections with people that you maybe have never met before, and 
really this is key to practice speaking about your work, okay? Keep in mind that an open studio visit can really provide a little less pressure for you um, and has often yielded exhibitions, meet, uh, future meetings, and, and even more studio visits and even uh, reviews by arts writers. So if you're in a position to offer a studio visit, I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Do not do too many. It becomes, uh, it becomes uh, a little too much to handle quite often. I say one to two a year is generally a good idea if you have the opportunity to do an open studio visit. This is also a great opportunity to invite groups of people in instead of um, having to schedule uh, certain times out of your busy work day. Um, an open studio says this is the time two times a year, one to two times a year that groups are invited to come in. So think about that, okay? Um, another type of studio visit is a dealer is interested in representing you. They want to come in. They want to they want to see what they believe is going to be um, a a great sale for for you for them and something that the community has been really just requesting and wanting to see. So that's another one. A collector that's coming in is interested in buying something from you. A fellow artist is doing a studio visit for a peer review or just to see what you're doing to get inspiration. Again, there's many types of studio visits, but one thing I want to hit home is if it's the first studio visit, just sit back, build a relationship, um, think about the conversation that you're having, and don't prep a hour-long uh, uh, lecture. Please, 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 please do not do that. If our time is set for an hour and I'm, I'm coming in for the first time, this is about a conversation. This is about us learning about each other, about the work that you're doing and about the work that I am doing and how that might be a cohesive relationship. It is not an opportunity for a lecture, okay? This is about listening on both ends so we can learn from each other. Right now, we're sort of in these two different spaces right now. We have these in-person ones and we have virtual. So let's touch on the in-person first. You know, a lot of times it's like, oh my God, I have so much to, so much to, so much art. What do I, how much do I display? Where do I display it? How do I display it? If we go back to what I said earlier, um, what you want is to make sure that you have a few, a few key pieces, key pieces out in order for you to showcase some of the work that you're really doing. It doesn't have to be just one series. It can be pieces from different series. Um, maybe you're not doing a series. Um, you're not doing any series and you have individual pieces. They can be different sizes. Think about what you wanna display um, and just know that this can vary. There's no right or wrong reason for this. Think about the size of your space. Think about um, the opportunity to be able to fully view the, the work um, and not have things hidden, right? So this is really, just again, on a case-by-case -case basis on what you display, right? Um, and whether or not things are hung, whether or not things are leaning against the wall, whether or not things are laid out on the table, there's no um, right or wrong for how you display it, what feels right to you in order to be able to best show your work. That's how much you display. Um, <laughs> there, I, I, I think it's always kind of funny, um, like when you talk about, you know, how much do you display? In this case, it also depends on the number of people you're going to have in there. So when I was just talking about the open studios, and if you have a group that's coming in, you're obviously not going to have enough space to be able to showcase that many, right? So you want to think about that. Maybe it's going to be a, selecting a small number of current works and bringing them out one by one. That is definitely um, an opportunity as well. Maybe you don't have them all out. Maybe you just have a stack and you pull one out and you talk about one at a time. That works great. Um, and that can also help to not overwhelm the visitor. I don't know about you, but if you go into a space and there's just so much going around everywhere, I have a hard time really trying to be able to focus on um, the work that I'm there to see. And then it, it's distracting. And that distraction can potentially lead to not having another visit, to not having an, um, an opportunity to showcase your work. Um, and then just, just, just know that the majority of you that are on this call, you've probably been doing all of this right already. No worries, okay? Um, when we get into the spot of who leads the conversation, that depends, it completely depends. This is your space that, you're, that people are coming into. 
This is your opportunity to lead the conversation if you would like to. But again, it's gonna be dependent upon what is the reason for the visit. Um, <laughs> perhaps you're a talker, you know, like me, um, and it comes easy to you to lead the conversation. But for others, that's a challenge to do that. But we want your voice to be heard. This is an opportunity again to represent your work. So be yourself, relax, and uh, just let it happen. It'll be great. But also, you know, when you're in these conversations and you're, um, you're having your banter, you're building a rapport, you know, this is also a really great opportunity, say, for instance, if a dealer or a collector um, uh, or, uh, um, or even, you know, a, a curator from a large institution that is, that is um, acquiring new works, this is an opportunity for you to know your pricing. When you're leading this conversation, depending upon who it's with, again, if this is with a dealer, a prospective collector, or a curator who's looking to acquire some work, know your pricing. If you do not have it memorized, that's fine. Don't worry about having things memorized. Just think about having potentially a list of the prices um, that you can give to the visitor. Um, that's as easy as just getting a piece of paper, having a list of that of the pieces that you're going to show and share that. If you do not have that available, you can always offer to send an email with that. But it is really important that this is an opportunity for you to have a sale if that's the intent of the in-person um, studio visit. Also, when you have a dealer or a, uh, um, especially a dealer or a gallerist in your space, this is an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Ask them about the market, especially if you do not have much knowledge on that topic. Do that to, so that you can protect yourself, your work, and your financial potential. I've had this conversation with a number of artists here that pricing work is really difficult, especially are you pricing work for like the Kentucky region? Are you pricing work for the Midwest region? Are you pricing work for East Coast, West Coast? Are you pricing work for a collector or for a museum? This is a really good conversation and a good relationship to build with a gallerist. This is, this is a really great one, okay? So think about that when you're in conversation with them. Seating. I touched on that a little bit already, but you know, um, sometimes I've been to a couple of these uh, studio visits where it's like, hey, be prepared. You're about to climb like 18 flights of stairs to get to my studio and it's not air conditioned, FYI. Um, at that point, who's leading the conversation is not going to be me because I'm going to need to take two minutes to take a deep breath, to, like to get my uh, to get my breath right. But at that point, I might really need a moment to just take a seat and collect myself before we dive into the studio visit. So seating in that case can be really important. Um, also, seating is really important if somebody that's coming to visit is a person with a disability. We wanna be respectful that everybody and anybody should have access to your work, but it is not always possible. We understand that there's not always an elevator. We understand that. But if this is, if there is an opportunity for you to provide seating for someone, then please do that. And, and if it's possible to have a clean seat for someone to sit in, um, that's really great as well. Doesn't need to be fancy, just clean, right? And then time for a studio visit. This, this ties back into what I said about the refreshment piece, right? Do you serve refreshments? Um, I have had a number of studio visits that have happened right at lunch, right at dinner, and right at breakfast. And it's my responsibility to take care of myself, to make sure that I'm okay, that I have water, that I have food, and that I'm fine. Um, I can also be somebody who, if I, if I have um, the the opportunity, I might bring something to the studio visit and offer to share it and vice versa. The artist might do that same thing, but I want to be really clear again. Some believe that this is standard protocol to offer refreshments based on the time of a studio visit, but I want to make it clear that not everyone has to make that happen um, and to not worry about it. It, however, can be a wonderful thing if you are worried about how to start a conversation. Offering someone a refreshment can already get a conversation going. So that is also another tactic or tool that you could have in your arsenal when you're doing a studio visit to sort of help calm maybe the, the nervous energy that you have as well as to just start a conversation on something other than diving immediately into your work. But again, thinking about the timing of a studio visit. Um, is your studio visit um, in the morning and you only have an hour, you know, it's probably going to go much quicker than, um, than 
uh, if you're if you've set up something for like a two three hour deep dive into your work, um, and at that point, you know somebody may be thirsty, and at least having something for them to drink is really wonderful. But again, not standard protocol. Okay. Virtual visits. Ah, the time and true <laughs> virtual world that we're living in, right? The, the, the interesting thing here is that I think a lot of people assume that virtual studio visits is a newer um, practice, and it's not. Virtual studio visits have been around for a really long time. Ever since the advent of being able to connect with someone um, virtually, this studio visits have been happening. I mean, it is not possible for a curator, say, in Minnesota to be able to talk to somebody in Vienna um, uh, and get on a plane and see them all the time. So virtual visits have been a really incredible opportunity for um, people in the art world for a long time. So it should be a little bit more uh, normalized than it is. And we should know that it's 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 great. But but with virtual, especially during this pandemic, I feel like we're we're in a space where people are asking a little bit more, what are the rules? What are the rules of a virtual studio visit? So this one I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into because we've been doing this so much more, okay? While, um, while we know that COVID and social distancing has really sort of pushed us um, outside of these old fashioned studio visits uh, in person, I mean, at this point for the foreseeable future, um, we need to really sort of embrace the virtual in a way that we haven't before. Um, in fact, uh, the easiest thing that we can do is first start off with knowing the platform that you're on. We're on Zoom right now. We, the majority of us, somehow Zoom became the platform for a lot of us to be on, but there are a number of other platforms. And if that works better for you as the artist and somebody's coming to see your work, you share the platform that, that is going to work best for you to showcase your work. Maybe it's Google Meet, maybe it's Slack, maybe it's FaceTime and all you, and, and um, you have an iPhone and, and they have an iPhone and that works best for you to show your work. You can do that. Pick the platform that works best for you to make it more comfortable for you. Now, um, <laughs> the thing is, is I actually, I actually almost kind of wish that there would be something that would be a glitch in, in this that would just like, have to show how hiccups happen during a virtual visit because they do. Um, a computer can shut down because you lost your battery. Uh, you lose internet access because maybe there's a storm that's happening or the phone rings and now there's like an interruption, right? These hiccups are just part of real life. So it is completely fine um, uh, to that if those happen, just roll with it. It's, 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 uh, it's a quote unquote, normal way um, of existing in, in, in this way. So do not worry about that. Um, sharing your work. Now I've had a number of, of virtual visits while I've been here and without having asked, because um, we are, we are as the visitor need to do the work uh, and the research on what we want to see. And sometimes artists will automatically just send you links of your work so that you're ready to, so that you know, what's, what, what you've been working on most recently, what is um, giving you joy right now in your work. Maybe there's um, you know, some in-process work that you wanna share that um, is not up currently on your um, any of your social media platforms or on your website. So at this point, when you do a virtual visit, it is imperative that you share your work with, uh, with the curator and, and or whoever the visitor is. Now, if they don't ask for it, um, then just feel free to send it along and, and, and just know that that's a really good practice just to always have. Share your work immediately, um, do it in advance um, because you know you don't wanna get into a thing where because I'm not in a physical space, they're not gonna know and understand my work, no. Especially, okay, let me give you an example. Um, one of the artists I recently met with does has sound in their art and we were doing a virtual visit. Well, during the time, the sound wouldn't work, but thankfully they had already sent me links to their work. So I knew how um, that music really tied into their work, how it aided the visual aspect of their work um, in getting a sense of how they wanted to build their work to be um, more sound creative, um, more um, specific in a uh, intersectional nuance that was present in their work, right? So because they shared it with me, that hiccup that happened wasn't a problem, right? So I, I know <laughs> expect hiccups is the next thing I have in here, but I also, 
I always think that that's almost one of the first things that we have to talk about when we're doing virtual is just expect the hiccups, right? Digital lag is real. Video can shut off. And we know how many, how many virtual like studio visits and or conferences and or Zoom meetings that we've been on where the video starts to, um, or the sound starts to get all crackly and you can't hear what's going on. So then you have to do, I'm gonna stop the video. Um, and then as things potentially worsen, you know, it's not ideal but um, you can also send links. If you send links back and forth, you can change it to a phone call um, because you've already set your work. Uh, the visitor should already have context to be able to continue the conversation with you. Staging, this is fun. I kind of think that like, I don't know, honestly, I'm literally just looking at my screen that has this presentation. I can't see if, uh, if you can even see me, I have no idea. I can't see any of the chat. But, you know, sort of setting the stage is also um, a lot of fun. It is not necessary, but it's fun. Um, it is an opportunity for you to be even extra creative um, in your work. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there's like that, like when Keith was introducing, you had that virtual background for the Zoom, right? Um, but sometimes for me, if I'm on a virtual visit, it's hard not to fixate what's in the background. So if that's the case, maybe you want to offer something in the background for people to watch. Now, there is a really, there's a really funny Twitter account actually called um, BC Credibility, where it's all about showcasing bookcases behind you. And so if you have a bookcase that happens to be behind you, this is an opportunity to, to know what is visible on screen for the person that's, um, that you're visiting with and figure out a way to um, offer them an opportunity to have uh, other ways of interpreting your work and or your space that you create in and have a little fun with it, right? So there are things you can position artwork. Um, if it's a virtual visit and you have some um, a visual art that you'd like to position, you could set that around. Um, and that's really wonderful. Um, even including art that's not yours, that could be a conversation starter, especially for those that might need that. Um, you can place books in the frame. That's great. And I hate to say this, but Oftentimes people can get really excited and you jump up and like, oh, I want to show you something else. It's really disappointing that I have to say this out loud, but please wear pants when you're doing a virtual studio visit. It has happened to me more than once um, and nobody wants to go there. Okay, let's just move on from that. <laughs> uh, we know what this says, assumptions, right? Assumptions make and out of you and me. So one of the things that I want to touch on here is just do not assume that a virtual studio visit is going to be better or worse, more important or less important than an in-person one. Treat it as if it was an in-person uh, studio visit. You know, again, this is a case by case uh, basis as each visitor that you have, critic, curator, artist, um, gallerist, is going to feel different about having a video chat. Um, if you have a uh, if your art is tech-based, it's gonna make the video chat a little bit easier. If it is, you know, large scale paintings, it's gonna be harder to see, you know, the brush strokes and um, to be able to show the full, uh, the full, uh, the full piece in frame uh, in order to be able to get the full uh, impact of what you're showing, right? But that does not mean that the virtual visit isn't going to be equally as good. I will say this, you know, Keith and I started this, uh, this webinar a little bit early and, you know, people were already on time. And when you are setting up an appointment with someone, your time as well as your visitor's time is equally as important. So show up, be on time, be early. Um, you know, a virtual visit means that you cannot blame uh, any of it on traffic, right? We can't do that anymore. Sorry. Um, uh, but it is really important to show up because that's an honoring to the other person that you cared enough to be there on time for that meeting, right? Um, and for some actually, which I find, um, you know, I'm really grateful that this is the case that opening up more studio visits to the opportunity of being virtual has really given a, a, a more genuine opportunity for those that have you know, um, issues being in close proximity with people. It allows them to sit in their own preferred space instead of, again, having to sort of create a space for someone. Um, it allows you to potentially dress a bit more casually than maybe if you were gonna be meeting with someone. It can lend itself to just being a little bit more relaxed because what you're doing here is you're having a conversation, right? You're having a conversation and it allows for a little bit ease of intimacy. I also wanna say that when we make assumptions, 
um, about how something is going to go, um, you can plan all you want. <laughs> just, just don't expect that everything is going to go smoothly. Um, there's nothing that says all of your preparation is going to go off without a hitch. In fact, if you plan for things to change, uh, it'll probably be easier when and if it does um, uh, happen when there is a hiccup. Um, but when it comes to empathy, a shared empathy is really important, okay? Again, we're both humans. Everybody that's in this space is a human. We're on equal footing, right, okay? Curators are humans, artists are humans. We are not gatekeepers of everything. We each are on equal footing in that, in that studio visit. And that's really important to know, you know, especially right now, we're all in the same boat with what's going on with the pandemics in the world. And with virtual conversations, there is an unusual intimacy that happens in these moments, right? And so an open hearted uh, connection with someone when speculating, conversating about your work, um, the art world and the world in general is a really wonderful thing if you can have a shared empathy about those things. We may not agree on everything, but a shared empathy around it is really wonderful if that's possible. Um, when I reached out to a number of curators, one of the things that came out was safe space. I was talking about creating a safe space, that this is something both artists and visitors need to create. And I wanna acknowledge that I don't honestly always believe that safe space is possible, but working towards one is necessary. Right. So this can mean doing your research on understanding the cultural significance and or difference that you exist in when you're sharing space, because this may be present in your work. Maybe there's a cultural underlier in the work that you're doing and the person that's coming to visit does not exist within that same cultural space. And so then they don't have that nuance. Right. So how do you create a safe space? You do that by offering them access to your work by sharing some of those things, sharing that historical context that allows you to sit in a space where you're not making assumptions and they're not making assumptions, okay? <laughs> Anybody remember telephone when you were a kid? I loved this photo. So I wanted to put this in here because communication is key, but communication can be hard if we are not listening and observing while we're talking, right? We can easily think we heard something, but it's very convoluted and distant. And that's what happens when we play this game as a kid. So prepare for the studio visit with questions. And I'm expected as the curator to walk in prepared and understanding the work of the artist that I did my research. As far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as the majority of, of curators are concerned, it is also your responsibility as the artist to also prepare. What do you know about me? What don't you know about me? Um, what are the things that you learned that you could tie into the work that you're doing and, and, and build an instant connection, right? This is also um, an opportunity to, to really um, state your intentions. When you're preparing for the studio visit, you can easily email um, the visitor and say, this is what I, you know, you can be really direct. You can say, I have exactly an hour. This is what I plan for the visit. Um, I, uh, I really want you to only see my new work. Please do not look at any of the work that is not facing forward. That is your prerogative, 100%. Um, now, a curator, we are naturally curious. We are going to come in and we're going to be like, so what's, what's turned around, you know? But you have every right to say it's not ready and I don't want to show it. And do not feel bad if that, if that comes up. Do not, do not feel bad. Um, when you are in the visit, it is really important to um, take notes. And that's for both of us. I always have a notebook. I'm always taking notes because there are things that are said that I want to remember. Um, each and every one of you has such a creative heart, spirit, mind that lends these, these beautiful um, moments of thought that are so fantastic. I can't walk away without writing what they are down. Plus, everybody's always like, have you met this person? Or do you know about this thing? And I want to know, I want to write it all down. I want to, I want to follow through with all the beautiful things that you're sharing with me in that space. And I hope that that's the case for you. Take notes, especially because you can get really caught up in a conversation and not remember anything that's happening. So um, some of the the thoughts that a, that some, a visitor has, um, you know, you may wish that you had taken notes. So instead of wishing, have that notepad ready to go, okay? Um, when you are meeting with someone, who are you meeting with? Think about who that is. Is it a meeting with a collector? Because that, that relationship between artist and collector can be a little bit tricky. Now, if you've met with Al, it was not tricky. I, he was just a relationship builder. He knew what was going on and he was interested in 
giving grace to the people that he spent time with and really wanting to build a relationship because it was about the relationship with the artist and then the work, right? The hope in this situation is that collectors will really want to get acquainted with the artist, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it's about purchasing something and that's the end all be all. So don't be offended by it, but it does happen, right? If this is a, if you're meeting with a curator or a critic or a gallerist, we may be looking for artwork for an upcoming exhibition. More often, than not, more often than not, we are actually coming to do the studio visit because we are curious to learn more about you and about your work. So this is really about finding out if there is a connection between us. If there is, especially for a first studio visit, if there is a connection between us, this connection might lead to an opportunity for an exhibition. This might lead to an opportunity for an acquisition. This might lead to an opportunity for a connection to a collector. So think about who you're meeting with and ask questions. Ask questions as much as you can ask. Do you think that there should be better lighting um, on my art or how, how should lighting work on this art piece? Ask, what are some ideal exhibition environments that my artwork could really thrive in? Ask about framing. How do I frame this art? Um, um, what does the work make the visitor think of? You know, we are in, a, again, it's a conversation. So, um, so sit in that space. Um, also, this is when you're preparing for a studio visit, this is something I, 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 I want to point out and I, I forgot to say it in the beginning when you're preparing, which is think about, again, asking if there is, um, if your work includes like strong odor materials, um, if possible, think about removing those from the, um, from the studio before the visit and or asking the person that's coming if they have any um, any uh, um, issues with the materials that you're using that give off a strong odor. It's not a good idea to have somebody come in there and they have to leave immediately because that wasn't addressed in the beginning, right? And that that is possible, that does happen. Um, think about, um, you know, honesty is 100% the best policy, right? If you don't know something, if you don't know the price of a piece of art, that's okay, don't make it up. Offer that you'll send something down the road. If they ask you like, who are your influences? And you're like, uh, and you just start rattling off something because this is what you think they want to hear. Don't do that. Get honesty is the best policy. I'm going to leave that. Who reaches out? So, you know, for me, I reached out through my assistant while I was here to ask about um, building an opportunity, having an opportunity to connect with you. This does not mean that you do not have um, an opportunity to do that yourself. The number one thing you can actually do at the end of a studio visit is to ask the visitor who else you should meet with. That's going to give you so many more opportunities and you can ask them, who should I meet with um, to show my work or to get advice on that you can connect me with? Not just give me a name, but who can you connect me with, right? So there's, again, relationships that are continuing to happen you and that visitor, that visitor is now introducing you to someone else. Maybe you're introducing someone else to that visitor. I've asked so many artists, like who else should I speak with? Or artists have given me names and contact information because they're just so excited to wanna to share somebody else's work, which I find so heartwarming and wonderful. And that is, that is what we want. We wanna have artists feel that they're in collaboration and a cohort together where you are here. We are all here in this together to support each other. So when it comes to reaching out, it can be arranged by gallerists, it can be arranged by collectors, it can be arranged by art consultants, nonprofits can reach out and ask, foundations can reach out and ask, anybody can ask, but also the artists you can ask, all right? And just once you do build that relationship in this communication, there's a thing that I find really, really meaningful is when you say thank you. And that's on my end, that's on anybody that visits, that's on the artists you know, that reciprocal relationship of being able to say, I learned something from you, or I connected with you and thank you is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful opportunity for um, continuing that connection. Also, you know, maybe that curator had like five studio visits that day and um, they, you know, like it's exhausting at the end of the day and you then send them a message that night or the following day that says, thank you for that time, I really appreciated it. Now you're at the top of their memory list because you thought to go that next step. So think about that, okay? How much time? This is really, again, case by case. 
Um, depends on the visitor. Sometimes they can be as short as 10 minutes or last for hours. Now, um, I, again, talker, um, I want to be really respectful of everybody's time, but if you are free to sit and talk, I, I want to do a deep dive. I want, again, mile deep, inch wide dive on your work, on, on you, on the opportunities to learn from you and with you, right? If the conversation is flowing, but you have a hard stop, it's fine. Just let me or whoever the visitor is know. Um, an extended conversation is great. I mean, just ask Keith. We could be on the on a call for three, four hours. Um, so from a curator's perspective, many studio visits in one day, like I said, are so exhausting. So art fatigue is very real. And if possible, try to think about scheduling your studio visit with a curator earlier in the morning um, rather than at the end of the day. And then don't rush. Super important to... Um, to think about that generally a successful um, studio visit lasts about an hour, right? That gives the artist enough time to show who the visitor around their studio, ask questions, time to get to know their practice, or if it's a virtual one, time to revisit the work that was shared earlier um, and build a rapport that again, hopefully will continue to build towards a lasting relationship. Um, I did say that, you know, sometimes a studio visit can be 10 minutes these happen. And sometimes it has nothing to do with whether or not they love your art. Sometimes it just means that the visitor and the artist may not, may already have a relationship and they are just in there to grab something. They're doing a studio visit to look at the most recent work. Then maybe you have two pieces that you're working on and it only takes 10 minutes to have that studio visit and you move on. Do not think that somebody being there for 10 minutes is not equally as valuable. Okay. Um, now, we as curators, I want to just talk from a, a personal point. We also have etiquette that we should have, right? We are not your therapist. We're not going to come in and ask a whole bunch of personal questions. That's off the table. Now, if the conversation flows where personal things come up and we feel comfortable with each other to do that deep dive, great. That's another opportunity to mile deep, inch wide that relationship. But it is really important that we know that this is about the art. It's about building relationship, but not about doing a, oh, so I heard this or I saw this about, no, that's, it's off the table, okay? And you're welcome to push back on anybody that is asking really deep personal questions that you do not want to answer. Or you can easily just say, I'm not interested in answering that and move on. Um, we should ask permission to look at art that is turned away from front facing. Again, curators, we're, we're, we're curious. We want to get in there. We want to see everything that's happening in those spaces. But it is up to us to ask permission, not only for the art that is not facing us, but also ask permission to um, take photos in that space and to post anything on social media. That is, up. we should be asking that permission. Like, can I take this photo? I'm going to share it on, you know, we definitely should ask permission. We're in a time right now where a lot of our work or images or um, pieces of us are out there without permission. And it is just really good etiquette for that to happen. Again, I've touched on, we need to do the research just as you. And again, I'm going to say this to let the artist take the lead if you choose. And you can set that up. And, um, but again, please, 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 please do not set up a PowerPoint presentation that is a lecture for an hour. Not great. <laughs> um, and the number one thing for us is to really ask you questions. Again, what is the studio visit for? Is it to learn about the art? Is it to learn about the artist? Is it about the new series of work? Is it about um, learning about your, your entire catalog of work and wanting to see it in, in full view? But asking questions about where you came from, how you got to where you are now and where you want to go is really important. It is up to us to ask those questions and for us to be honest about our intent. What are we there for? It's really important. I know that this is for artists, but I think it's really important that you also see the other side. What is it that we are supposed to do as well? Okay. Um, now, without uh, sitting in this space and assuming that I have all the answers, I think it's actually really important that I offer um, nuances uh, from other curators. So I'm going to read a couple of things from some curators. So pardon me that I have some papers here. And I have asked curators that I've worked with in large institutions, curators in college institutions, large colleges, small colleges, independent curators, and um, small uh, museums um, as well. So again, I think it's really important that you get um, other thoughts so it's not just one perspective, right? So I'm, in, I'm not going to read everything because, oh, that's too much. Um, but what I can do is say, <clears throat> um, Juana Sullivan Jansen, an independent curator, writer, and educator at the University of Minnesota, 
said, at the end of your studio visit, if you have a business card or a postcard you can offer as a takeaway, please do that. We see a lot of artists and sharing social media sites and a business card and especially social media sites that are up to date. And I know that that's a lot of work and we're always in that process. So, you know, don't feel bad, but trying to keep those up to date for a studio visit is really important too. Um, and feature that feature good images is one of the easiest ways for a curator to, again, at the end of the day, look back on their notes, see what they have and have something that's tangible to walk away with to continue that connection. Okay. Um, and she also believes that, um, that, Sending a thank you email or a thank you card um, after a studio visit is really important because the hope is that it will encourage invitations for future events, not only for the visitor to invite you, but for you to invite them, okay? Uh, Bob Casalino, who currently has an exhibit at The Speed right now um, called Supernatural, is the Patrick and Amy Butler Curator of Paintings at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. You know, he says that it is a privilege to be allowed or invited into an artist space. But if artists are eager to have visitors in for feedback, the best thing is to see it as a conversation and open dialogue. I've been saying that, right? Do not launch into explanations or over explain what's happening. Just let the person come in and find ways to ask questions because each visit will be different. Knowing that, um, that these leaps through curiosity are happening because of your work and they will grow organically and help the artist have new and multiple viewpoints to guide the discussion. The work leads the way um, and will lead, um, and the more you realize the many ways your work might be seen and understood, will help lead you back to a reflection on your practice. That's important, again, back to that note taking, see where the conversation is going, how people are responding to it, and how it can lead you back to reflecting on your practice. Um, and, you know, really be organized. That's a big one. Um, you have this incredible sculpture park here, Josephine Sculpture Park. Well, in Minnesota, we have the Franconia Sculpture Park, and the executive director and chief curator there said, God, I have so many suggestions. It's hard to pick just one. Perhaps the top one for her is just to be prepared and to do your research on the person that you're doing the studio visit with. When artists do not take the time to understand the visitor, in this case, the curator's interests or background, yet they expect the curator to have done that research on them, it's really disappointing. It is unfortunate, especially depending upon the amount of time when an artist shows you their entire artistic background that you've already figured out from their website and you now you have no time to actually look at the new work. Really important. KMAC, one of our favorites here in Kentucky. Uh, Joey Yates, the curatorial director at KMAC says that his ultimate goal with a studio visit is to eventually over the course of a dialogue, get a central motivating reason for why the artist needs to make the work. Why do you need to make this work? What is the one reason that you need to make this work? Maybe the studio visit is there. Maybe it's more than one reason. Maybe it's because it's rewarding when you get to see a reflection of your work, of you as a person, or maybe it's rewarding because you as the artist gets to see the person you're speaking with offer thoughts and inspiration in the work that you've produced. The, um, it's also um, eventually, as I start to inquire about seeing work, they begin to pull things out of flat files or behind cabinets. I really do want to see everything, including the work they might not consider successful. There can be a lot to talk about and wade through in terms of ideas. So that's also really important, right? I said there are things that are in the back and art, we need to ask permission to turn a piece of art around and talk about it. So maybe you think it's not ready, but having somebody with a keen eye can really potentially enhance what comes next. Um, I have two more and then we'll be done. And I know we might go over a little and I hope you can all stay if you have questions. So I just wanted to get all of this information um, out there too. Um, Michelle Wingard, a professor of art and gallery director at Bethel University in Minnesota says that studio visits at their best are an authentic, are an opportunity to authentically grow your art and collaborate and collaborative network, AKA to build a friendship. This shows a spirit of generosity and hospitality. And it is so important, beyond important, in fact, to be genuine and try to not think too much about what you will take away from the, from the visit. Instead, aim to think more about what you're authentically bringing to it. Love that. Um, 
because we have these expectations that that visit is going to give us everything we want. And the last um, one I'm gonna say is Jara Patrick. She's the gallery director and curator for the Law of Warshaw Gallery at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And she says, don't expect a show or an opportunity or a sale from that first visit. That visit is about building relationships and asking yourself, whether you're the curator, the gallerist, the artist, another artist, what can we do to support each other? Thank you. Well, thank you, Esther. Um, if anybody has any questions, I will say, I think you were, you, uh, you, you were so engrossing, nobody's asked a question yet. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, but, so let me ask you, I was thinking, so the, we talked about all the reasons that you, ha you might have a visit. Is there ever, would there ever be a reason why somebody, like a, why an artist might say, no, I can't. Oh, for sure. Host. Yeah. A hundred percent. There's a reason. There's many reasons. Um, sometime, you know, sometimes a, the reason that um, somebody says no might honestly flat out be that they have um, been influenced by other people's opinions about the person that's coming to visit. I really strongly encourage that everybody meets everybody on their own playing field. Do not take outside opinion as a reason to not say yes to a potential opportunity. Okay. I also think that um, it is, it is, it has happened to say no, because you're just not ready. You're not there. You're not ready to show something yet. You want to give it a little bit more time and you have absolutely the right to say, I'm not ready yet. Can we schedule this out for a month or two down the road when I've had more time? Life happens. It is important and imperative for us to really ask the question, are we ready for what may or may not come from this? So yeah, absolutely. There's a number of reasons. And I know that there are a lot more um, uh, ways and reasons why we say no. Some of it also could be if I don't have a studio and you have to come in my home, what are you going to judge me in relation to my home before you even see my work? And that's okay. real. Okay, cool. Uh, a couple of questions have come up now. Uh, uh, Lori, she, her, Kos Koskaskia Land. I'm, I'm just trying to read that, my eyes are bad. Uh, she says, I wonder more about having a studio visit if the studio is part of your home. Is it seen as unprofessional? How common is it for artists to actually have studio visits if the studio is in the home? My home is large, so it's unnecessary to have a studio visit of the home, but I feel like having an open studio or inviting someone to the home would just be weird. I love this question, Lori, thank you. I think it is absolutely, totally professional to invite somebody into your space. What's unprofessional is that the person that's coming in there starts to judge you based on that space. Now, we, there is so many things that have um, offered an opportunity for people. And there's like these sort of traditional pathways that people assume you have to have. Like if you do not have an offsite studio, then you haven't made it as an artist. And I do not ascribe to that. People have um, really important and wonderful things to offer. And they maybe have to take care of a child so they can only do it at home. Maybe their home, like Lori, you said, is an opportunity because you have a big enough space to do that. Why spend money somewhere else? Absolutely. And you know, um, in Minnesota, there are a number of open studios that happen in homes. And it's actually a really wonderful um, thing. And what, what happens, and this might be the key, is you can invite other artists to set up in your home to have an open studio with multiple artists. If you have the space to do that, that's some of the things that I've seen that have been really successful. So that, and it can even be like, I'll host it this month. Somebody else is hosting it three months down the road, so on and so forth. So it doesn't always have to be in one home and you help build again, a community, a cohort and um, a, a collaboration in that space. That's a, that's a really great question. Uh, well, then there's two other questions that I, th I think are very related. Uh, so uh, about about how an artist approaches a curator. Uh, Hannah DeWitt asks, is it appropriate to, to invite a critic or curator for a studio visit that doesn't know you yet, or should they reach out to you? And uh, Deborah Lott kind of echoes that in, in how she phrases it, if I can scroll this up. Uh, how do you approach a curator to arrange a studio visit? And I think that I can understand it's like, are they going to be dismissive? You know, it's easy to think that they're not going to want to meet with you when, how do you, how do you go through that? I mean, that that's real, but like, you know, it's like the cold call, right? Nobody likes that. Nobody wants to do that, but yet 
How are you going to get there if maybe you haven't been in spaces to get there, right? This is where that reciprocity piece is for me. We, if, if, if I'm the artist and I just had a studio visit with someone, why don't I then, if I have friends that need a studio visit that haven't had one before, why don't I use that relationship that I've now built and turn that into an opportunity to showcase and, um, and share uh, that, 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 that connection, that opportunity and say, Hey, there's another artist I'd really like you to reach out to. Now, if the curator or the gallerist or whoever they're connecting them to doesn't reach out, I want you as the artist to just really know that it is not a slam on you. It may just be that that curator is really only focused on a specific style of art right now. And it doesn't align with what they're looking for. It doesn't mean that you might not get a follow on their social, on your social media. It might mean something else. And, and I think it, when you reach out, don't just reach out just to be like, hi, I'm an artist and I think you'd like my work. Um, you should come and do a studio visit. Explain what it is that you're looking for. Really think about what are you needing from that person that you're asking some for them to do something for. Again, ask other friends, ask other artists. If you have had a studio visit, what did I say at the end of your studio visit to always ask, <laughs> who should I meet with to show my work, get, get uh, feedback from, etc. And how can you, how can you introduce me via email? So it is, it is that labyrinth of connection that we need to build that that's really how this is successful a hundred percent how it's successful right because then you can say well uh esther callahan told me i should reach out to you mm -hmm. yes yeah and i i don't i don't again none of us are gatekeepers we want people to be connected i can say you know what i'm the gallery uh or i'm the curator of american paintings and you're doing um contemporary uh uh videography and it doesn't work in my realm but i know somebody or some people who would love this and let me connect you right? Always ask for what you want, what you're looking for, and an opportunity that fits for them. Uh, and then if it doesn't work for them, how can they potentially authentically connect you with somebody else who might be interested in that work? Also, sometimes expect that you might be rejected. There might be somebody that says, I'm just not interested in your work. Again, not everybody's work is for everyone. That's the beauty of it. Like, we all find who we're attracted to, what we're attracted to. It is not that every piece of art is for everyone. It's just not. Would it, would it also perhaps be a good idea to maybe make a little bit of an introduction to, of yourself, like maybe maybe include a CV or something, or, yes. or, or recently I showed work at, yes. you know, Revelry I mean, when you If you're like a college student who's just graduated, mm -hmm. um, you're coming out of a master's program and you don't really um, have an opportunity yet to, um, to have made connections. Well, while you're in school, it is really important for you um, to move past uh, um, just feeling, I'm just a student, I'm just an emerging artist. It is up to you to start working, working that network. And that means going to shows, going to galleries, um, introducing yourself at openings, making it a point that you've built these connections that you're building this web. Because if you don't have that, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, and, and you can always go back to your professors. They have connections. I'm, I don't know how many professors I've met that are practicing artists here. So they have those connections and can do that work for you. If you're showing up in their class, they'll show up for you. And then if you're past that and you're in emerging outside of school and or you're in that, that shift between emerging and mid-career and you haven't really had a time, I mean, the pandemic really showed us that we, what, how do we stay connected? Well, we've had all of these virtual opportunities and that virtual opportunity has actually lent itself to making it easier to make um, e-connections with people. So take advantage of this moment. Reach out to anybody and everybody. I mean, I never thought that I was going to have an opportunity to meet with some curators. And all I did was like, I'm going to send an email and introduce myself and say what I'm looking for and why this person made an impact on me. And bam, now we're doing curatorial projects together. It's great. You never know what's going to happen. You never know. Well, um, I, that's all the questions that have been presented. Uh, uh... Wait, there's three more. Wait. But Lori asked one, um, and then Liz asked, any tips for artists oh, who sorry, don't have a lot of physical space? You know, that's a really good question. And I think um, this is where when you have opportunities with organizations to, when they ask, you know, what are some needs that you have is to continue to ask, to say that I need more physical space. You know, 
Keith, does LVA have a list of open studios where studios are that people can work in? Hey, Lori, if you have a big house, do you have an opportunity for another artist to come in and potentially do some physical work in your space collaboratively? How can other artists and other institutions and organizations really help with that? You know, I, I, this is, this, these are the questions to ask. I know that there's not always a clear, direct answer for that one, because especially depending upon the size of the work that you're doing, it can make for a really difficult, um, it, it, for a difficult thing. But I, I, my biggest tip is to just ask everybody, do you have, uh, do you have any physical space that I could work in? Do you have something? And if it means that it's financially, um, uh, on, you're not able to do that, then, you know, I get that, but um, we just got to keep asking. I, I, it is fascinating to me how many places are like barely, um, I don't, barely functioning and should be condemned, but you could basically get a big giant studio space for like a hundred dollars and, and be able to make that work. I mean, it's a really good question and it's a tough one, Liz. I, I, I appreciate that question. I really do. I really do. Um, and then there's another one on that list from uh, uh, Giovanni Bennett. Mm. What major shifts in the art world during this pandemic have you observed that excites or concerns you? Ooh, Giovanni, that's a big old question. Um, there's a lot. I think the one thing that I've noticed is like, it's not, not just the, um, the COVID pandemic, but this pandemic of, of racism and erasure that's been happening um, all, all across the country. I mean, we've seen it happen here with Breonna Taylor and the... Um, um, uprisings that have happened in Minnesota. It was around George Floyd and Philando Castile and so many more. Um, and it is, you know, what I've noticed is this shift in who is being invited into space. And so I think a lot of Black artists have been um, invited in uh, to share their work, show their work, and, and have their work purchased in a way that I haven't seen before. So that excites me. But also, <clears throat> um, one of the things that I think I've also noticed is a shift in museum leadership um, and in the conversations that museums are having. Um, really necessary conversations. And I, what I want to say is there's this really great um, organization um, that's it's called Museums Are Not Neutral. Um, if you all don't know that organization, get to know them a little bit because they really try to hold museums accountable for what it is that they need to be doing. Museums should be sites for social action. So what are we able to offer within those, um, within those sites? I am excited about having the things that are externally facing become internal action because a lot of things can seem really, really thoughtful that are happening outside, but then you hear from staff inside that it's not reflective on the inside. So what I see is this opportunity for this marathon. It's not a sprint because nothing well done is ever done quickly. Um, uh, unless maybe like your whole thing is like, all I have to do is just, eat. I mean, there, of course there are some things done quickly, but um, in this case, you know, when you're really trying to sort of shift the sort of traditional mindset of museums, of art collecting, of artwork, the thing that really excites me is that opportunity for this marathon to happen in bigger and broader conversation around equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion that really needs to, to happen. It also, not only does it excite me, it also concerns me because it concerns me for those that are within those um, spaces, those that are more diverse or um, um, differently abled or um, intersectional in the way that they work, being held to the fire in a different way. So that concerns me. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Giovanni. Okay. Um, well, I think I think that about wraps it up. I, I want to tell everybody uh, first off, just thank you, Esther, for a great a great hour. And uh, but I want I want to before we leave, I want to tell everybody that the next uh, one in the series, uh, the Artist Resource Series, will be November sixteenth at six p.m. Demystifying Grant Writing with Mary Bainbridge, who is on with us tonight. Hi, Mary, uh, and uh, who is the Senior Grant Specialist specialist at Spalding University. And I actually put the registration link in the chat if you want to go ahead and click on and do that and be one of the first to, uh, to, to get involved with that. And I want to give special thanks again to, uh, to Brooke Smith uh, for his support of this ongoing series and especially for tonight's, uh, for tonight's special guest, again, to the Great Metals Foundation, Julian Robson and, um, and uh, Al Shands. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this this has been recorded. We're still recording, and Good. it will be on our YouTube channel. 
uh, within a day or two, we'll have it posted up there. So uh, if you want to make reference to it or suggest to people who weren't able to join us to take a look at it, that would be great. Uh, and again, thanks, Esther, and everybody have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Oh, such lovely thoughts. Appreciate everybody.